Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to New Zor Education. Uh, we continue discussing gravitational field and uh, in this lecture we will talk about potential and kinetic energy related to uh, gravitational field and how it's all related to energy conservation. Uh, this lecture is part of the course called Physics 14 presented on Unizor.com. Um, the course um, is, uh, well, uh, it, it has prerequisites and one of the prerequ prerequisites is um, the course called Mass 14 on the same website. Um, also what's important is presented on unizor.com is a, it's a course. Now if you found this lecture on YouTube by searching for whatever topic that would be just a single lecture um, and I do recommend to take the whole course because obviously all lectures are interrelated and uh, presented in certain logical sequence. Okay, now uh, by the way the site is free and contains no ads so no problem with that. Okay, uh, talking about gravitational field and its uh, energy. Well, um, we have already started um, amount of work which um, gravitational field performs by attracting <coughs> excuse me by attracting objects which are in that field let's just consider a, a, a ideal and simple case if this is the source of energy uh, a gravitational field and you have an object uh, at certain location R1 uh, from this uh, point mass which is the source of gravitation and uh, we would like to move it to location R2. Now the amount of work which is needed to to do this particular um, uh, transformation which is performed either by the gravitational field if we are going towards the source when it attracts or by us if R2 is greater than R1 which means we are taking away from the gravitational field. It's calculated um, using the formula which we have derived um, in the previous lecture um, W from R1 to R2 is equal to uh, <coughs> mass of this object uh, times g m divided by r r2 minus g m divided by r1 or if you wish g m m 1 over r2 minus 1 over r1 now let's just think about the sign of this sign is very important if R2, as on this picture, is smaller, then um, the difference will be um, positive. So, amount of work which is performed by the gravitational field is positive. Now, if R2 is greater, it will be negative because it's not the gravitational field, it's we who are performing the work against the gravitational field. So, we always have to take into consideration who does the job and from which perspective we are actually looking. If we are looking from our viewpoint, uh, the sign should be minus of this. If you are looking from the gravitational viewpoint, it should be like, like it is. But anyway, we, we know what the sign actually is, so let me just um, say that we will probably deal with absolute value of this uh, in all cases to have the work positive and then we will think about which sign to apply. Okay, now, so let's consider for a moment that we have placed uh, our object at location R1 from the source of gravity and it's at rest, which means something is holding this particular object at this particular place. But for instance, if this is the source of gravity, like surface of the Earth, and this is the direction which is actually vertical um, upwards, then we have some kind of a 
support like a table or whatever it is where the object uh, lies upon and the gravitational field force is um, equivalent to reaction of the support and that's why the, uh, the object is at rest. Now, then we just take this support away and let the object basically do whatever it's supposed to do in this situation. And what is this? Well, there is a gravity which attracts this object. It goes towards location R2. <clears throat> the field performs this work. Now, the work is supposed to be conserved, so where the energy goes. Now, since the uh, field performs some work, it means that in this particular position, uh, our object has certain potential energy. Potential because there is some work which is uh, uh, spent, which is done by the field to move it from here to here. Where the energy goes? Well, obviously, when it reaches the point R2, its potential energy is less, but it has certain speed. Why the speed? Well, because there is a force which is actually accelerates um, uh, object as it moves from R1 to R2. Mind you, the force is variable, so we can't really just use the plain formulas of, uh, of mechanics uh, where the force usually is constant, acceleration therefore is constant, and therefore the uh, speed very easy to calculate. It's not easy to calculate because the force is variable and acceleration therefore is variable. And uh, you know the force is basically uh, proportional to product of the mass divided by uh, distance from the source of gravity. So it's changing because R is changing. All right. However, the law of conservation of energy um, can be applied here and what I can say is the following. Now, potential energy at any point Let's just think about this. Potential energy at any point should be measured by amount of work which um, is needed to place this particular object into this particular place. So let's just assume that object is not there at all. Well, or you can also say it's somewhere very, very far away, infinitely far away from the source not to have any influence of the gravitational field on the, f uh, on, on the object. And now we are bringing this object towards this particular position. Now, we are doing, so we are supposed to do some work. Well, however, it's not actually we, it's gravitational field which does the work, so it will be a negative thing. But in any case, what's the amount of work which is necessary to bring the object into this particular position in absolute value? Well, again, that's basically the same formula, except you can put R1 equals to infinity and R2 equals to R1. So it will be basically G M M divided by R1, right? So R1 is infinity, R2 is equal to R1. So in this particular case, this is amount of energy, amount of work, so to speak, which is needed to bring object here. So this is an amount of potential energy in this particular case. So this is a difference between potential energy in this field and potential energy in this field, which means this is a measure of increment of potential energy, either increasing or decreasing. Well, now, obviously, this same increment of potential energy should correspond to increment of the kinetic energy. Now, kinetic energy in the beginning, well, since speed at point R1 is equal to zero, and speed at point R2 is Vr2, so but, uh, kinetic energy at the very end of this uh, traveling is um, this one. This is kinetic energy at point R2. So what I'm saying is that this Oh, sorry, square. So, mv squared divided by 2. This is kinetic energy, mechanical energy, 
which uh, object um, will uh, will have as it ends this trip from uh, point R1 to point R2. And this is the kinetic energy which is supposed to be equal to the difference in potential energies. So let's put it this way, that the absolute value of kinetic energy at point R2 should be equal to absolute value of work from R1 to R2. So I don't want to deal with the signs, so let's assume this is exactly the position, which means this is positive, and if this is positive, then I can actually equate this with m v square v r2 divided by 2. Now, obviously, this thing goes out, and this is assuming that the speed at this point is equal to zero. So this is basically how we can calculate speed at the point, uh, at the end point of traveling within the gravitational field. Now again, back to um, bringing an object from infinity to point R. Let me just do it with one R only. So if R1 is equal to infinity and R2 is equal to R, our formula would be mvr squared divided by 2 is equal to g uh, m m. Um, so 1 over r minus, okay, just divide it like this, that's what it will be. From which, again, it's independent of mass of the probe object, so vr square is equal to 2gm divided by r, and from this vr is equal to square root of 2gm divided by r. So this is the speed of the object if it was in the infinity and the gravitational uh, force brings it into point at the distance r. So let me just do another picture here. So if this is my object, this is my force of gravity. So whenever I'm bringing the object from infinity to this point, well, not I am bringing, it's gravitational field actually which brings, then the final speed would be this. So it depends on the object itself, uh, which is the source of energy, and it depends on the position. Well, g is universal constant, you know that. So it depends on the uh, mass of the source of the gravity and the position. Now, what's interesting is that, let's just think about the symmetry of the situation. If gravitational field spends um, this amount of energy to bring the object, the probe object, from the infinity to this point, now then V, if we want to bring it back to infinity to fly away from the source of gravity, we have to spend exactly the same amount of energy because again, energy must be conserved. The same energy which comes in and a gravitational field spends, now we have to spend the same amount of energy to restore situation back to original when this object, probe object, is in, in infinity. Now, let's go back to our um, uh, space traveling interests. What is this amount of energy which I have to spend uh, to bring objects from here to infinity? This is amount of energy which is necessary for a spaceship, let's say, to completely leave 
the gravitational field of some object, some planet or whatever, whether it's an Earth or Jupiter or whatever. All right? Now, I have exactly the same amount of energy and therefore my speed, if I just push very, very strongly, push this particular probe object towards this direction, but the push should be, should be very, very strong, so it goes all the way to infinity. Because it, if it will be not as strong, it will go and then return back and fall, right? So, same thing, if I'm on, on the surface of the Earth, so my radius is the radius of the Earth, right? This is basically the planet. And I'm on the surface of the planet. If I would like to throw a stone with certain speed such that this stone will fly away from uh, the gravitational field of, of, of Earth goes to you know, Pluto, Neptune, whatever. Uh, I have to have this speed. So this is so-called escape speed. Now, we can very easily calculate it because we know the mass of the, of the Earth, we know the gravitational constant, we know the radius of the, of the planet, so we just calculate. And in the notes for this lecture I do have detailed calculations, but basically the answer is my speed should be equal to 11.2 kilometers per second. This is the speed of uh, the well, spaceship initial speed at least, or the speed which it, can, it, it, it should actually develop um, to escape the gravitational field of the Earth. Well, obviously in practice the situation is slightly different because in the beginning the spaceship starts from the surface of the Earth with a slow speed and then it speeds up during the first whatever number of minutes. Uh, and by that time it's already farther away, so my R is different, so the maximum speed which it needs to leave the Earth would be, eventually, it would be less than 11 points. We don't really need this speed. Only if we are throwing in one shot the stone from the surface of the Earth, we need this speed to really leave the surface, um, to the gravitational field of the Earth. If, however slowly, we reach a higher height above the surface of the Earth, then obviously this will be uh, greater, so the whole speed would be less. But it still will be significant. I mean, if it's 11.2 and we are, and, and well, Earth is a big planet, right? So we have to really move its, uh, the radius of the Earth is something like 640, 6,400 kilometers. That's the radius. So you can imagine to substantially increase this number, we have to really go up by hundreds of kilometers. Otherwise, it will be an insignificant change. So we can go slowly uh, uh, a few hundred kilometers, a few hundred kilometers, and only then we will start feeling that this speed is not really necessary. We can have 11.1, .1, for instance, kilometers per second. But it's still a lot. I mean, you still have to have a very powerful engine to get away from, um, uh, from the planet. So all these calculations obviously are made by people who are involved in, in uh, space traveling. Now, um, by the way, the similar number uh, to uh, escape, for instance, the um, moon's gravitational field, if moon is by itself without the Earth, uh, I think it's 2.4 kilometers per second. Well, obviously because the mass is smaller. Radius is also smaller, but mass is significantly smaller. Um, all right, so, and, and for the Sun, for instance, to leave the gravitational field of the Sun, it would be much, much bigger than that, because the Sun is huge, obviously. Um, all right, well, basically that's all I wanted to talk about today. Um, just think about uh, the whole uh, purpose of this lecture. I was trying to 
connect together potential energy which every probe object in the gravitational field exists and kinetic energy so if we are moving further for instance and we have to spend some um, uh, energy um, then the potential energy will increase because we are spending our energy and that actually contributes that adds to the potential energy at this point if we move it to further from the planet moving against the gravitational field it increases the potential energy then again if the object just left by itself and gravitational field moves it back to itself uh, attracts it then potential energy is diminishing but its kinetic energy is uh, increasing um, I would also like to warn you in this formula um, you see all these things were derived from the um, some kind of an assumption that we're dealing with a point mass source of gravitational field and if it's a point mass then obviously r can be however small and then the whole thing goes to infinity which obviously is not practical kind of situation because there are no point masses we have planets we have some other objects which are which which have certain uh, uh, size uh, so this is not a point mass it's really like a planet which has certain radius which means that this thing has the lowest possible value which is the ra real radius of the object which is a source of gravity so there are no uh, infinity here r cannot go to zero obviously only in this ideal situation um, then uh, I would probably have to um, tell you another thing you see we, if we are dealing with a spherical source of energy like planet for instance ideal planet ideal sphere then um, for any point which is outside uh, of this surface of, of its surface the planet acts as if the whole mass is concentrated in its center of the sphere now it can be proven by integrating it's a three-dimensional integral uh, of, of this uh, of this sphere because every point attracts at certain with a certain with a certain force right if this is the planet and this is the object then as if the whole uh, mass of this planet is concentrated in its center so the force which this thing this probe object is experiencing is exactly the same from the whole planet as if it would be a point object um, concentrated in, in, in the center of this sphere and again to prove it we have to do the three-dimensional integral because every piece is attracting something so we have three-dimensional integral which is this something like this and um, having this three-dimensional integral we can um, uh, calculate attraction of each individual uh, element uh, three-dimensional element of the volume of uh, this planet and after integration it will be obvious that, th that the result will be the same as if the whole mass m is concentrated in one thing and the whole distance is the distance between the masses although in this particular case when we are integrating obviously every piece has a different direction different distance etc but this is a simple exercise in calculus which I don't think I want to do I'm just telling you that that's the case <coughs> another interesting case also can be proven with integration that if this sphere has an empty an empty space uh, inside so it's actually like two spheres one inside of another but the matter is only in between these two spheres and the center is empty then what's interesting is that the gravitation inside would be zero it would be uh, basically weightless kind of a, a situation but that's another very simple exercise in, in calculus which uh, I'll think about whether to, to, to go through this integration or not with you um, but that's kind of an interesting um, 
aspect of the gravitational field. All right, so that's it for today. Thank you very much. I do suggest you to read the notes for this lecture. They have all these detailed calculations about the moon and the, uh, and the Earth. And uh, that's it. Thanks and uh, good luck. <laughs>